Lord bless you as you're seated. Pastor John forgot to tell you that I was only 14 when I came that first time to the church. It's okay. How many know that every season is a good season? And uh, I just want to thank Pastor John and Lois for the years of friendship, but I also want to thank you for inviting a dinosaur back to the stage. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's a great joy for me. I, I think that um, it's exciting when God speaks to us about, well, about anything. When God speaks, it's pretty exciting. Um, but when you know nothing, it's kind of really cool. And, and several weeks ago, I was just praying and knowing that I come here and then we got a call from New Zealand so I knew that I had to go over there for a period of time and, uh, and so I thought, well, I, I wonder, Father, if you can give me a glimpse of what you've got in mind before I leave. That would settle my heart a bit because I mightn't have much time when I got back. And so I, I just said, Father, what do you see? What's in your heart? Bearing in mind that it's what, four, five, six, I don't know how many years since I was in the church here and I have not a clue. I, I had no idea about anything about the church whatsoever, any dis, anything about it whatsoever, full stop. And so I started with a blank piece of paper and just said, Father, whatever you think, whatever's in your intention, and that's important to me, because we can see things in the spirit and we can see things prophetically, but I want to see what he sees. I want to see what my father has already programmed, what he has already destined to be, what is on his agenda. We can have a lot of things on our agenda. But father, what's on your agenda? What have you purposed to do? And I, um, as soon as I did that, I certain things began to take place. And I, I want you to accept the integrity of my heart that I knew nothing, zero. I hadn't a clue whether John had turned purple or uh, whether he now wore, wore a cape and flew around the auditorium. I, I had no idea what was going on in the life of this church. And um, I began to deceive for you, just excuse me, you know what? Jesus never had an iPad. What a blessed thing it would be. Yeah. And the first scripture the Lord gave me was Ecclesiastes 3.1. Just out of the blue. And we can show it up on the screen. To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. And I thought every season has a purpose. And God has a purpose, so he introduces the season. But you know, the wonderful thing about the God that we serve is that he'll never leave us in the dark concerning that season. When he has got changes in mind, he will always inform us. He'll, if we've got a hungry heart, if we've got a hungry heart, and a listening ear, Father will speak. He doesn't live in the shadows. He's the author of light, can you say Amen. Isaiah 42, verse 9 came to mind. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. And I love the next line. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. In other words, Father's not in, into the uh, business of confusion. Well, you know, well before we wake up to something, he's already planned it. He's already got it in mind. Do you know that there's no a time in eternity? So all the prophetic is, is the Father allows you for a moment to step through the veil into the world of his reality, and which is eternity, and therefore you can zip up and down the timeline. It's really quite cool. And you can see what Father has in mind before it actually takes place. It's not spooky at all. And then my, the next thing, this isn't supposed to be a classic message on some subject, by the way. 
This is as good as it gets. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm just downloading what Father gave me. And next thing I'm doing, I, I'm listening to this incredible song by a group by the name of Casting Crowns, and, it, and it, a phrase leapt out. I said, oh, that's significant for the message as well. And it says this, you are the God, you are the God of all my days. Seasons change, but you remain the same. And I thought, that's got to be said. And then I, I said, Father, I have no idea what's going on in that church. But I need something very clear. And I was just in my new, I've got a little prayer cap and I built, and I was just on my knees and I was just worshipping. And as clear as anything, I heard these words. A shift is coming. A new day dawns. A new era begins. And I says, Lord, this is sounding scarily like I have to go out and thin ice here. Because <laughs> if, if there's no changes coming in, in the life of this church, I'm going to get stoned in the car park. <laughs> but I was so convinced that God was speaking to me. A new era yeah. begins. Yeah. And I want to explain to you a little bit what that means because it can be misunderstood. According to the dictionary, the beginning of a new era is this. A period of time marked by distinctive character or events that changes all that comes after it. In other words, when they, when they discovered steam as a source of power, that wasn't just a happening. It was the beginning of a new era. Why? Well, everything changed after that. The first motor car, I mean, everything changed after that. It was not just an event. It was the beginning of a new era. When they discovered penicillin, that wasn't just another piece of medicine. No, it began a new era. If I was to say the word 9-11, everybody knows what I mean. Why? Because the whole world changed after 9-11. It wasn't just a happening. It was the beginning of a new era. So by the time my father has been downloading all of this, I'm beginning to suspect some things. And I mean, like Rome, they, all this bunch of guys wanted to do was build a city and call it Rome. Well, that's what they did, but it changed the world. Why? Because of the beginning of a new era. So uh, what I want you to understand is that what I'm sharing this morning, and what I'm burdened to share, it's not, it's not a new page in the book. It's not a new chapter. It's not even a new season. It's the beginning of a new era. And I want to speak into that this morning. And that's my first job. But the father told me I had two this morning. So we'll see how time goes. But I got, actually got two responsibilities. Because I pick up in this auditorium that there are those who might be like I was and feel that 2022 was a little rugged. Just a little rugged. Well, I've got great news for you. If your 2022 was really rugged, you are in for a great 23 and an even better 24. But I'll get, I'll get to that later, okay? But I felt I had to say something and declare it. And that was this, long before, long before pastors John and Lois and anybody else in the leadership team ever thought about what's happening right now, God had it planned. They, they didn't come up with the idea. They heard him declare his idea. And I think that is very, very important. Now, with every God-given, God-initiative change of era, as it were, 
introduction of a new era, but away. Please don't think for a second that I'm speaking just about the church corporate. I am, definitely. But who is the church? Aren't you all the church? These are leaders in the church, but you're, you're the church. Therefore, if it's the beginning of a new era, I believe, and I want you to receive this prophetically, that this is a moment, this is a time, this is a day of appointment that everybody in this auditorium can begin to believe in their heart that God has a new era for you. That, that yesterday's contradiction will not determine the promise and the fulfillment of tomorrow. And so I want to stir your heart about that. But with every God-given, God-initiated new era, two things are vital. The first is an honouring of the past. I think we've got that on the screen too. An honouring of the past. And the second is an embracing of the future. Now, those two things are critical because without the honoring of the past, the future, listen to me carefully, the future cannot build on the legacy and foundation that's already been paid for by the past. The strength of that legacy, the inherited legacy is utterly critical to the future of God's people. But without the embracing of the future, the greater promise already established and given to that previous era, the legacy, the dreams, all that contained in that, they can never be fully fulfilled unless, unless the future is also embraced. Isaac, Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, we all know the story, but I'll tell you one thing, when Isaac, when Isaac picked up the new era, he didn't start from scratch. Isaac knew that the power of his tomorrow lay in the covenant given to his father, Abraham. And so his job wasn't to come up with a covenant, come up with a commission, no, because God had already given it to Abraham. His job was to pick up on what God Almighty had given and bring it to a whole new level and bring it into a future of God's intention. And because he was able to reach back to the covenant of his father, but reach forward to the next generation. It went Abraham and Isaac, but it also went to Jacob and Jacob became Israel. But I want to tell you this right now, if Isaac had decided that no, I, 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 we start from scratch, I'll tell you what, there'd been no Jacob, there'd been no Israel. And so covenant, I, I believe fiercely in a covenant. I believe fiercely in legacy. I believe God does. And so he is involved in the birthing of a new era. Three things. Let me drop these down as well while we're here. It's wonderful. There must be great liberty in this place. Do you know why? I haven't even bothered to find the clock, let alone look at it. <laughs> Which is a fearsome thing for you, really. But... The first thing is a willingness and desire for change. Now, I've just said the covenant does not change. <laughs> but structures and methods do. So part of, part of the process of change, part of the process of embracing a new era, and I know what I'm talking about, because I'm just embracing one too. And for those of you that are not, well, no, I won't say that, but that think I should retire, <laughs> we've tried that five times. It doesn't work, all right? Uh, I'm 75, I've been preaching for 56 years, and, and I'm... And the Lord's just been downloading a whole bunch of new stuff that we're going to initiate over the next three or four years. So it's, it's nothing to do with age. It's got everything to hear about hearing what Father is saying about the present and about the future. But a willingness for change 
Well, that's imperative. Not only as a church, by the way, but you as individuals. I, I so sense here in this place this morning that God is not just speaking to the church collective and its leadership, which he is, but he's wanting to reach deep down inside of every single one of you and draw out that hunger for a different tomorrow, for a new tomorrow. It's time to go to a whole new level. Maybe it's your marriage or your family or your finances or, or, or your business or your occupation or ministry or whatever it is. But my friends, never, never settle down and decide that enough is enough. It's never enough. It's time to go to a whole new level. I'll be really up front. I believe it's time that if you're really serious for God, that you plan your diaries to include times where you can get apart and listen. I'm Irish, I was born there. Can't do anything about that. But even us Irish get the simple things. You can't obey what you have not heard. You know, uh, people crying out for miracles, crying out for a new day, crying out for fruitfulness, crying out for prosperity. Hey, uh, God's, not, God's not holding back anything. But he's, he's wanting some people who will get aside and start to listen with a fully surrendered heart, with an unconditional availability so that God can speak what he actually wants to speak into your life and into your heart. Some new things are coming. So number one is a willingness and a passionate desire for change, for more, increase, enlargement. That's got to grip your spirit. The second thing is, and you, I'll be very, very brief on this, but... A willingness to let go unresolved issues. A, a willingness to let go unresolved issues. My friends, as I said, 75, preaching 56 years, I've learned something. For every single person here, I got, to, I got news for you. There'll always be something that, that, that you don't feel that you got justice on or, or you didn't get the answers on or you still got questions about. Uh, look, join the party. But you've got to dump them. You've got to sever them. You've got to cut them off. You've got, you have got to let them go, people, or they will anchor you to yesterday's disappointments rather than propel you into tomorrow's promise. Let them go. Number three, a desire for a new wineskin with increased capacity. It's really simple. You cannot put 10 litres of wine into a wine skin designed for five litres. Something's going to rip. So, so I want to say this. You honour the past. You embrace the future. But whenever there's a change of era, it's never to maintain the status quo. And, and you need to be willing to freshly examine things like structures or even leadership patterns or perceptions or thinking. Why? Because God's about to, to bring in a new era of enlargement and increased capacity. Yeah. Thinking then has to go to a different level, but never with the dishonoring of the legacy already established because the future depends on the covenant already given. But you know what? As I was continuing to wait on the Lord, I thought the whole thing was finished then, and I felt the urge of the Holy Spirit says, no, for this church in particular, there is a fourth point. And so it's obviously a very important one, and this is the point, an anticipation of the miraculous. 
and anticipation of the miraculous, as I, as I just began to lean into this new era that's coming, and I did, I, I really prayed into it, and Father kind of drew back the veil and showed me some stuff that he intended, and I'm telling you now, you need an anticipation of the miraculous. Are you, are you believing for the miracle, Martin? I, I've got a book out there, and this is not a, me trying to sell a book. In fact, if you can't afford it, grab it anyhow. But, you know, this book here, I wasn't, I wasn't going to bring you books. And Pastor John said, well, have you got the right things, like your set up? And all? I said, no. I wasn't in to bring any, but it was a spontaneous last minute thing because this book says, you did what? You say, that's a strange title. Yeah. It's a strange story. It's a, it, someone said, I want you to write an autobiography of the last 50 odd years in ministry. I says, you'll never get it, not from me. And then the Lord spoke to me, he says, what about all the miracles I've done? What did you learn? What did you actually learn about me? Not about the miracle, but what did you learn about me when I did that and when I did that and when I did that? What, what did that actually tell you about me? And that started making me come alive. And I, I thought, whoa, the God that we serve is incredible. And, and, and so it unlocked even a, a new level of the miraculous in my own life. And, and I'm not saying this lightly, but we have seen so many absolute outright miracles in the last 50 years. Some of them are just staggering. And if I had another hour and a half, I'd tell you about five of them. But not just the big church things. He, he's really interested in you. Oh, I can't help it. I'm Irish. I'll give you one story. An extra, extra two minutes. Um, Margaret and I were, by the way, she's not with me this morning. Gives her apologies. She loves John and Lois, but she's having a battle with osteoporosis and she's uh, had seven, no, eight crushed fractures in her back. And now it's affected her hips and her feet. And, and this morning she was in quite a bit of pain, so... She was not able to be with us. Um, but Margaret and I were, <laughs> were in Switzerland in the middle of... You know, you're going to say, oh, he's making this up. I'm not, it's documented. <laughs> we were in Switzerland in the middle of summer. I was in shorts, a T-shirt, sitting out there doing a sunbake. Uh, and, this, and, and Margaret came out and she said... Because uh, it was a chalet thing, and it was look, you could look right down the valley. She says, Can you imagine this in the middle of winter? It would be white with snow. What a scene that would be. And I thought, Oh, yeah. Went to bed, and a thought occurred to me I serve a creator. I said, Father, why don't you show off? I mean, you did the whole thing in six days. You can do this. Now you say you don't speak to God like that. Yes, I do. He's my father. And he's yours too. I said, Father, go on. Just do it. Just do it. Just do it. When you sleep, not exaggerating, not one little bit. It's all documented. Got photographs, everything. When you sleep. Woke up in the morning and we were freezing. <laughs> and, and I got out and I pulled back the curtains of the window and everything is white and the snow is so heavy it's breaking the branches off the trees. And all the locals are running around like chooks without a head saying, well, it can't snow, it's the middle of summer. I didn't actually tell them why, but... Um, <laughs> But, but I thought, you might say, oh, that's ridiculous. Well, I got about 30 other totally ridiculous stories in here. Why? Because I find that God is, there's no limit on God. It's the, the limit is us. And it all is in our anticipation. Do we actually anticipate the miraculous? Do we get up in the morning and expect it?
I have no idea where I am at. Okay. But I do know this. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19. We'll take verse 18. Where is that clock, by the way? Oh, well, it, it, it's probably irrelevant. Okay. <laughs> Isaiah 43, 18 says, Do not remember the former things and don't consider the things of old. You say, that's a contradiction to what you're saying. No, because the original Hebrew uh, says it a little bit differently. Um, don't get anchored to the former things and don't let constant worry about the things of old determine how you think in the future. Verse 19, behold, I'll do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will make a road in the wilderness. And I got so quickened on that, I put it in the highlights and I couldn't get over it. A road in the, in the wilderness. And I thought, why would anybody even want to put a road in the wilderness? I can think of a lot of better places to put a road. And that's the Lord spoke to me as clear as a bell and said, that's because you do not understand the word. The word wilderness in the Hebrew is the word midbar. And do you know what it actually is translated? A pasture of grazing land untouched by human hand. When, when they journeyed, when they discovered America and they journeyed from the East Coast over to the West Coast in their, you know, in their wagon trains and stuff, uh, it, many of them kept journals. And in the journals, you read this kind of statement again and again. Or we came over the brow of the hill and there was this magnificent valley of grazing land and beauty and untouched wilderness and it was there that we settled the wilderness isn't talking here about a place of dryness it's talking about a place of discovery a place of discovery uh, uh, and the Lord spoke to me this way he says I'll make a road for them I'll make a road for Encompassed Church to go into a new era of discovery. And so if you're wanting the status quo to be the status quo and stay the status quo, sorry, not going to happen. There's going to be a season of discovery. And God is going to build on the past and then fulfill the future. And friends, you've got to be willing to let go of the past, embrace the future, and yet never losing sight that the joy and the celebration and the delight and the wonder uh, uh, that you feel in the few years that are lie ahead of you as you discover this and discover that is because somebody paid the price to put a foundation and a legacy and a covenant together that God is still honoring. I've got to work towards the eventual possibility of a probable close. You like the accuracy of that? Mm. I just want to say this. I, I, I've got other stuff here, but I think I've downloaded what God wants you to hear. There's a birthing going on. There's a birthing. And any mother that's had children will tell you that there's two things when you give birth or you're getting close to giving birth. There's a joyous anticipation and there's some uncomfortable changes in the body. So that's, that's par for the course. There'll be changes going on in the body, but accept that because of the joy of the birth. I preached a message and because of time is gone and I know it is gone now, but I preached a message in November the 4th, 2022 at Planet Shakers that many of you will want to take a look at on YouTube because I spoke on 2022 explained. Therefore, 2023 anticipated. And it came out of an experience in my own life wherever when, I, when COVID uh, struck, I was actually in Nashville at the time 
uh, when everything shut down and I got home just in time, and, but because most of my ministry is actually interstate and international, and at that time it was probably almost exclusively interstate and international at that time, and then what happened was I got 100% cancellation of all ministry, and then after that, I, I got these uncomfortable feelings in the chest, you know, and I felt fit. I felt I wasn't struggling. I just got uncomfortable feelings. Went in, and that ended up with me having a quintuple bypass. I was seven and a half hours on the operating table, and the surgeon, who's not even a Christian, said, how come you're alive? He says, not possible. It's medically impossible for you to have existed for the last few years. And it's a matter of record. And I just smiled and I said, ha, 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 I know why. <laughs> and I gave him my testimony. And he, and he said, totally, I don't know what nationality or what it was. I think it was Hindu or something, but I don't know. But he said to me, I knew there had to be a higher power involved because medically this is impossible. And so they, they, but that, but I still had a quintuple bypass. And then when I'm getting over the quintuple bypass, thinking, oh, now I'll get back in stride. Our whole ministry centre, my office, our studio, the staff quarters, everything went up in an inferno, just 2 a.m. in the morning, on a Sunday morning of all days, and uh, it was raised to the ground. And that led to all sorts of other things. And then Margaret started getting her crushed fractures in the back. One, two, three, four, five, six. And so we had a very, very interesting 22. But my father never goes to sleep. And when I was on the and I was on the front uh, deck one morning, and I'm sorry to take so much extra time, but listen to me. I was on that deck one morning, and I said, "Father, I don't really care. I don't care if I never preach again." It'd been 18 months by that stage since I'd been on a platform. I had no invitations, and I said, "Because it's not about what we do." It's about who we are. And I said, Father, as long as I have this flowing, because, oh, man, I was having the most incredible encounters with my father's heart. And I said, as long as this is flowing, the rest of the world, I don't care. And I actually used these words, so some of you should be alert right now because you use similar words about something else. I said, I guess... I guess I'm not going to be preaching on any platforms anymore. And I want you to know that I'm real good about that. And I'm fine with that, Father. Whatever you want is good enough for me. And three days later, the phone started. And it was Blitzkrieg. You know, and I preached in about five different major apostolic movements uh, in Australia, uh, um, uh, just one after the other, influences, planet shakers, equip, and it just kept on going, and it's like a tidal wave. And I, you know what? I just felt that Father was waiting for me to say I didn't need it. Friends, you don't need what you do. You need the revelation of his fatherhood and that you're his cherished son and daughter. And if you are, then your tomorrow is going to be awesome. Why? But because he's going to be directing it. I've got to go. I've said that already. You know the safest place on the planet? Total dependence. Total dependence. I wrote something in my notes and this morning got reminded of it myself. The more dependent I am, the more empowered I am. The more dependent I am, the more empowered I am. The more unconditionally surrendered I am, the more available I am. My friends, I feel, I've got to wrap it up. I could keep going for another hour and a half. But I want to tell you something, you're on the brink 
of some of a whole new era. Honoring the past, thanking God for the existing covenant and building on it and seeing it explode into the future of Father's intention. Knowing that before you ever woke up to it, he had it on his agenda. That tells me that every one of you in this congregation this morning is a candidate for a new era yourself. And I wonder if there's anybody, and I'm going to close, but anybody this morning where something has resonated in your spirit and you say, Father, I'm unconditionally available. Unconditionally available. Sensing a total dependence. And I'm crying out for a new day. And I've got a listening ear and a hungry heart. If that's you, just stand to your feet right now. I'm not going to get you to come forward, but there's something about acknowledging what God is saying right now. Don't be polite and stand. Stand because that's exactly how you feel. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, right now we thank You that You're not only the God of yesterday and today, but You're the God of our future. And Father, I declare that this day, oh, I shall witness that a new era is being birthed and born in the history and life of this church. But oh God, that a new era is dawning for so many of those that stand before you right now. I pray that there'll be an, an ability to let go yesterday and uh, reach out with great hunger for tomorrow. I pray there'll be a rising anticipation of the miraculous. Father, I thank you, Lord. Make a, give them each one a revelation of your fatherhood. Lord, that as a true son and a true daughter, that they are the, the delight of your heart, Father. Let them know, Father, that you love them indescribably and you accept them unconditionally. Thank you, Father, for the past. Thank you for the present. Thank you for the future, which we embrace in Jesus' name. Amen.